Hello everyone and welcome to another book talk. I just finished reading a novel of 600 pages. I don't often read novels that long because, as you know, I am the impatient type. But this novel kept me going. I had to find out what happened right till the end. So today I'll be talking about The Doomsday Book by Connie Willis, an American writer. Now, before I start, I just want to issue two cautions. One is, please try to avoid reading the back of the book, the blurb. It gives away a very important plot twist that doesn't happen until page 390. So that's that far into the book two-thirds through. So I think that's a bit naughty by the publisher who's otherwise excellent, Golans, their science fiction masterworks series. Okay, it's forgivable because you will probably have worked it out by the time you get to page 390, but it is still not absolutely certain and certainly not the how, where, why and what. Yeah, if you can avoid it, I think it's a good idea. The other, even more important caution, concerns the effect that the book might have on you. It certainly had a very strong emotional impact on me. And it is a dark story. It gets very fraught and upsetting towards the end. And I just want to say, if you feel in a fragile state, maybe emotionally or mentally, it might not be the best book. Okay, just take care, please. So, what is the Doomsday Book? The original Doomsday Book on which this title is based, what does it actually mean? There's a bit of history behind it, so I'll just explain so you have the context. Doomsday, spelt like Doomsday Book, So, Doomsday Book is the Middle English spelling of how we now spell it in modern English with a double O. And that was a manuscript record of the Great Survey, undertaken by King William I, also known as William the Conqueror. And you'll probably know 1066, the Normans invaded England and William the Conqueror conquered England. Like all good conquerors, he wanted to know what he had conquered and what it was worth. So this great survey was completed in 1086, so 20 years after he had actually conquered. The survey took in much of England and parts of Wales and recorded a whole lot of statistics, really, mainly land ownership, land usage, any records that were available. You can imagine, to historians of the Middle Ages, this is one of the most important prime sources of information. So the word doomsday book didn't actually come into usage until about the 12th century. And people called it that because the decisions recorded in the book were unalterable. They were, in a way, like the last judgment. And this is, in a way, what this book is about, the last judgment the end of the world, as the contemporaries saw it in the 1300s. That was, of course, the century which was known nowadays mainly for an unimaginably terrible outbreak of the bubonic plague. And not surprisingly, you see on the front cover a picture, you may be familiar with this costume, which is what the plague doctors wore in medieval times. I will need to explain a bit about the story and the characters, so there will inevitably be a few spoilers. I'll obviously try and keep them as low as possible. 
So the story is about a young woman, a history research student at the University of Oxford in England, and the story is set in quite a distant future, in the 2100, so over a hundred years from our present date. And in that future time, researchers and academics have worked out a way of time travel. Now, you can instantly see why this book appealed to me, why I wanted to read it. You know, I'm a time travel fanatic. So our young woman, she's called Kivrin, Kivrin Engel, under the auspices of various historical faculties of colleges at the University of Oxford. The whole bureaucratic structure of the Oxford colleges is very well portrayed, uh, and nothing much seems to have changed in nearly over a 100 years. She is desperate to make a research trip to the Middle Ages. Going that far back into the past has not often been attempted yet in those days, and there are obviously some concerns. And they picked a period that should be relatively safe, they figured out, from various epidemics, war, pestilence, whatever, and they picked the year 1320. And the time travel mechanism is pretty accurate on the whole. Well, as you can imagine, there is huge scope for all sorts of things to go wrong. Now, the book is structured with two stories running in parallel. So you alternate from chapters to chapters between the future present tense 2100 something in Oxford and the past, the Middle Ages in the 1300s. I have read and studied quite a lot of medieval history. It happens to be a big interest area of mine. So I was really intrigued how she would um, portray life in the Middle Ages. That, that really drew me to the book. And I have to say straight away that the medieval parts of Kivrin experiencing life in the 14th century had me absolutely enthralled. I love that sort of thing. And if you love historical fiction and a lot of detail about daily life in those times, I think you will be fascinated too. I could not wait to always get back to the chapters that were set in that time in the medieval part rather than the current time in Oxford. Now, I'm not saying that this part was not well written. That's not the case. In fact, an awful lot happens in parallel. I don't want to give too much away, but in the future, in the uh, 2100s, uh, society has gone through many, many pandemics. Now, Connie Willis wrote this book back in the 1990s. She could not possibly have anticipated something like COVID. But I have to say, she's pretty spot on in her description of how a pandemic might break out, how people react, what happens medically, socially, otherwise. It is fascinating too. There's a very, very serious outbreak just at the time when Kivrin makes the time travel drop into the Middle Ages. And we always suspect that there is some sort of connection between what happens in the present and in the past. But it's tricky to work out. I did sort of work it out in the end, but... Willis always distracts you really cleverly with detail that you follow this path and that path and are kept away from the real answer to the problem. The resolution only occurs very, very late in the book, in the last fifth of the book. By then, you will be galloping through the pages. <laughs>
So how does Connie Willis approach describing a pandemic? If you think about um, COVID and after over three years now, we know that over two million people have died. And the problem is our human brains cannot really imagine what that means. Two million is so vast a number and in a way so anonymous, like most statistics, that it's hard to relate to that. So Connie Willis does what Jane Austen already did, who wrote about her own work as being two inches of ivory on which she works with a very fine brush. Meaning, of course, that she deals with a very small compass, a small group of people, a small location, and with a lot of detail. And that is how you bring a cross emotional impact even where wider issues are concerned you can't focus in on almost unimaginable numbers you you lose the reader but the moment you home in on a few characters you will probably reel in your reader and that is precisely what Connie Willis does in the Middle Ages with Kivrin experiencing what happens at that time in a very small village with a small group of people near Oxford. Now, one reason why I didn't relate to the strand of the story set in the current time in Oxford quite as well is that there was an awful lot of what seemed to me at the time extraneous detail about, you know, how the colleges were run and what individuals were doing, whether they took an umbrella or not. And then a whole group of bell ringers arrives from the United States. And I kept thinking, why do I have to read about these bell ringers? And at first, they're really annoying and irritating. And then later on, you realize, they're also a source of humor and then you are introduced to an awkward and rather silly 13 year old teenager who happens to be dumped with our main academic tutor Mr Dunworthy who's the only one who desperately wants to make sure that Kevrin is all right so on page 4 we are introduced indirectly to Colin the teenager whom nobody wants uh, during the pandemic and he's being uh, shuffled off to Oxford uh, so a great aunt Mary, who was an important uh, character due to her uh, medical status and uh, knowledge, uh, says about him, he's 13, a nice boy, very bright, uh, though he has the most wretched vocabulary. Everything is either necrotic or apocalyptic. And that's true, and that is a very a funny note in the story because Colin is highly enthusiastic about all sorts of things and has his teenager jargon, which at the time is clearly necrotic as a, a term of dislike or apocalyptic, meaning absolutely awesome. But I still wasn't sure why I had to bother with Colin and the bell ringers and all sorts of stuff. And this is the brilliance of Connie Willis, that at the end of the story, you know exactly why you ploughed through all that strange, random, apparently unrelated detail of everyday life. Suddenly, everything takes on a very different perspective and importance. And I have to say, Colin turned out to be one of my favorite characters. He was in equal measure completely irritating and also heroic. You don't know that in the beginning, but people will always surprise you. And Connie Willis is very good at showing that. It pays with this book um, to pay attention in particular to anything that looks like a biblical quote or even Latin church phrases, 
because religion was, of course, so immensely important in the Middle Ages. People in those days thought of their life on earth as just a transitory period, and the real life was the one after death. It was not until I had finished the book and had another look at the beginning that I realized that in the first few pages there were obvious clues planted which I had simply not recognized because of that focus on religious matters, phrases, quotes, etc. It is a form of foreshadowing. And later on, it weighs heavily on the events and your own reaction to that. Now, I mentioned already when I talked about COVID and pandemics, how statistics are really difficult for our brains to cope with, because they don't tell us anything really individual. Of necessity, they are usually generalized figures. And that is uh, one sub-theme that this novel deals with, sometimes in a humorous manner and often, and especially towards the end, in a very serious way. The people in the future in Oxford think they know so much about the Middle Ages and they have all sorts of statistics at their fingertips. And Kivrin has been told and taught so much that she all has in her brain database And you know what? Real life turns out to look very, very different from statistics. And that is something Connie Willis really drives home very effectively. The other technique she is incredibly good at, and what helps to just drive the plot, is how aware she is of what I would call the vagaries of conversation. People often simply don't ask the right question or they will give you an answer that is actually not an answer because they're thinking about something different, but you don't realize that. So there will be all sorts of crossed wires. There will be lacunae. There will be bits missing that you aren't even aware are missing that need filling in. And as a reader, you sometimes sit there and you think, Kivrin, you need to ask another question. And she just doesn't get the opportunity because, as you know, in life, people come and go and there's constantly something happening and opportunities come and pass and you may miss them. It's this simple flow of life and the often devastating results that can happen because of random occurrences and coincidences, she has captured brilliantly. You never think, oh yeah, she did that because it was necessary for the plot and therefore he never asked the right question. No, it does not come across as such at all. It is completely convincing. Now, the Doomsday Book, as much as it is a terrible story about a time when terrible things happened, is also, among other things, a love story. At first, I thought it might be between Kivrin and her tutor, Mr. Dunworthy, but that is not the case. They have more of a father-daughter relationship. No, The love story is so unusual and probably so unexpected, I think you'll be floored by it. I think it's the most unusual love story I have ever come across. And I did shed a few tears towards the end. It all started on page 500 when I shed my first tear. And I think you will too. And after that, there is no letting up and you have to be prepared. It's a tough ride, but it's totally worth it, really. 
So I just wanted to read a couple of uh, short passages um, for you. So you get just a little bit of the flavor of the prose. You know I always pay a lot of attention to the prose, how well I think a writer writes. And you might remember that in a previous video, I talked about how impressed I was with the prose of Station Eleven. It doesn't mean it has to be fancy, no. I prefer plain and simple prose, but it has to flow and it has to tell me things without obviously heavily striving to do so. So this is from right at the beginning when Mr. Dunworthy and uh, Kivrin meet up to discuss her research project for going to the Middle Ages. He is convinced that she can't go and she shouldn't go. He is aware of the enormous number of dangers. Kivrin had come to see him when she was a first-year student. I want to go to the Middle Ages, she had said. She wasn't even a meter and a half tall and her fair hair was in braids. She hadn't looked old enough to cross the street by herself. You can't, he had said, his first mistake. Of course, she is completely and utterly determined. It's impossible, he said. Even if it were opened, the medieval department wouldn't send a woman. An unaccompanied woman was unheard of in the 14th century. Only women of the lowest class went about alone, and they were fair game for any man or beast who happened along. Women of the nobility and even the emerging middle class were constantly attended by their fathers or their husbands or their servants, usually all three. And even if you weren't a woman, you're a student. The 14th century is far too dangerous for medieval to consider sending a student. They would send an experienced historian. Of course, Mr. Dunworthy's objections fall on a student who knows how to argue her case. So Kivrin, once uh, she is there at the local manor house in the 14th century near Oxford, uh, struggles at first mightily with the language because what she's been taught of medieval English is nothing like what she hears. Uh, but there are other things that are constantly surprising that she hadn't expected. The language isn't the only thing off. My dress is all wrong, of far too fine a weave, and the blue is too bright, dyed with woad or not. I haven't seen any bright colours at all. I'm too tall, my teeth are too good, and my hands are wrong, in spite of my muddy labours at the archaeological dig. They should not only have been dirtier, but I should have chillblains. Everyone's hands, even the children's, are chapped and bleeding. It is, after all, December. And that is just one little insight and there are so many of those and you spend a lot of time with Kivrin just experiencing everyday life. Nothing much happens, no great events occur, no exciting stuff, no, just the plot of daily life. You begin to wonder, okay, but Where's all this going? Well, the reason why Connie Willis took 600 pages to reach the conclusion, I think, is because she needed us to be so completely immersed in that life, with Kivrin in particular, that we would be able to get through that last difficult bit and to really understand it and to empathize and be completely emotionally connected. You can't do that in just a few pages. You can't do that with description, which is called telling in writing terms. You have to show not to tell. And that's what she's doing. And she's deliberately taking so long and piling on the detail because 
by the time the story accelerates, we understand Kivrin's attachment to this family and this village and her unique position. I'm not saying any more. I don't want to spoil it because if you haven't read the book yet, I would like you to. If you have any interest at all in time travel and in historical fiction, in particular in the Middle Ages, I think this is a really, really strong contender uh, for one of the great books. Now, after such a very long and emotionally harrowing read, I was wondering what I should go to next. And, of course, I will want to read more of Connie Willis's work. Fortunately, I had the good sense to already order another book of hers, which I think is also in this series of loosely connected books about um, time travel, to say nothing of the dog. Well, anything with a dog in it has my attention immediately, of course. I do look forward to reading that. Uh, Whether I want to read another Connie Willis straight away, I'm not quite sure. So, Poodle Pa had a suggestion. Poodle Pa is an enormous fan of Becky Chambers. He's read all of her books and he thinks she's just the bee's knees, honestly. So I haven't got around to that quartet of books, which is her main over yet. But Poodle Pa suggested I might want to start with a very short book of hers that is a standalone story. I don't need any of the other books as background. And he said it would be a good introduction to the way she writes and the kind of worlds she creates. So I'm probably going to go with that. And something else happened. One of those things that you can only call serendipity. Poodle Pa and I were browsing around one evening and we said, oh, mortal engines. We've Have we ever looked at that? I remembered it didn't have very good reviews, the movie. So I said, well, let's just have a quick look. We started it up and then we remembered we had actually watched it before years ago. Okay. And we just kept watching and and we got pulled back in and we really enjoyed it. So watched it a second time. Of course, huge involvement from a lot of New Zealanders and they're like, um, you know, Peter Jackson and so on. And we loved in particular the world building and the way the world was shaped and portrayed. So we looked into the author who I hadn't known previously. He's called Philip Reeve, and he wrote the four books that make up the Mortal Engines Quartet. And Poodle Pa went to the library and uh, found one of the books in the series. Uh, This happens to be the third one, yes, we know, Um, but that doesn't matter. Um, He started reading it. He said, gosh, he does write well. So we're looking into Philip Reeve and what he's written also. And I have a feeling I will be talking more about this author in the future. So that is all for today from me. You will let me know. Please talk about uh, the Doomsday book in particular, if you've read it. There is an awful lot more to talk about. This, This book is extraordinary. Thank you very much, as always, for your time. Please keep well. I'm Food for Dogs. Bye-bye.